used to burn my house, steal my car, drink my liquor from an old fruit jar. Well, doing the thing that you want to do. But, uh, uh, honey, lay off of my shoes and no shoes. Step on my blue suede shoes. Well, you can do anything but lay off of my blue suede shoes. Rock it! For the money, little for the show, three to get ready now. Go, 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 but don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Well, you can do anything but the deal for my blue suede shoes. It's the one for the money, three for the show, three to get ready now. Go, cat, go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoes. His first album was made up mostly of other people's songs that appealed to him, like Carl Perkins. Blue suede shoes. Well, it's one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready. Now go, cat, go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoes. You can do anything but get off of my blue suede shoes. Well, you can knock me down. Step in my face, slander my name all over the place. We'll do anything that you wanna do. But uh, uh, honey, lay off of them shoes and don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Well, you can do anything but take me over my blue suede shoes. Let's go, cat. The album was really a collection of songs that Elvis knew from his childhood or from just past weeks on the R&B charts where he picked up a lot of his material. After leaving Tupelo, Mississippi as a child, Elvis went to Memphis. Uh, it was a lucky move for him since the city was full of musical possibilities and music was Elvis's first passion. I'm leaving town for sure Well, then you won't be bothered with me Hanging right on the door, but that's all right He was doing some of Crudup's songs Dee, 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 I need you loving That's all right That's all right now, mama Well, that long black train got my baby and gone. Train, train, coming round, round the bend. Well, now you may go to college, you may go to school, you may have a pink Cadillac, but don't you be nobody's fool. Now, baby, come back, baby, come, come back, baby. I'm back, and baby, I want to play out with you. And now, a little song that I have on record, R.C.A. Victor, entitled Heartbreak Hotel.
Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of Lonely Street, that heartbreak hotel where I'll be. I'll be this lonely baby. Well, I'm so lonely. I'll be so lonely. I could die. Go Mississippi Bullfrog sitting on a hollow stump. I'm like a Mississippi Bullfrog sitting on a hollow stump. I got so many women, I don't know which way to jump. Well, I said flip, flop, and fly. I don't care if I die. Well, if your baby leaves you, you got a tail to tell. Well, just take a walk down the lonely street to Heartbreak Hotel where you will be. I think that they well knew that they had a good looking boy and that they uh, had images of that. But if you look at the album as such, I wouldn't say they present him as a very good looking guy on that first album. I'm not saying he's looking bad on him, but it's not a pop star photo of any sort. It's more actually trying to portray what he may have been all about. And in that way, I think the album's uh, cover is very true to what it was all about and what Elvis' music was about. Set a new standard for what you could achieve in pop music. I think it also very clearly sent the signal to the industry that, wow, not only can we have a hit record, it can actually turn into something this big. So I think a lot of these artists that were at the same time as Elvis, the record company started looking into, we need to do a, an album by Fats Domino, Little Richard, and so on and so forth. Um, the numbers were staggering. I mean, 300, over 300,000 was a new goal for a pop record. And, and it, it broadened the business perspective of what it was they were dealing with. The, the uh, Rolling Stone book of CDs makes the point that uh, not only did Elvis make the word hillbilly obsolete, but he also made the word race obsolete. And Victor, yes, had a race catalog for decades. Um, it had pretty well been expunged before 1956, uh, but there were people who thought in those terms too. Uh, more's the pity. So here was this precedent setter, this dam buster of all in a single individual, a single young, young individual. <laughs> It should never be forgotten how close he was to both his parents. He remained with his father right up until his death. His father was his best friend. He was, uh, they shared both a common experience and an outlook which none of the guys around him could fully appreciate. The reason for his special closeness with his mother was that I think she shared the same kind of imagination that Elvis had. They each had what amounted to visions. Uh, whether you call them religious visions or not, I don't know, but this is one of the things that became so uh, intrinsic to Elvis's later life was his quest for a kind of um, visionary type of religion. But even as a child, uh, he would talk about how both he and his mother would see in the sky, would, would essentially have visions. And I think that's probably, temperamentally, that's what would have made him 
somewhat closer to his mother than to his father, but he was equally close to both, really. He always had the sense, for example, that he was meant for something great that he was chosen in some way to do what he did. And I don't think he meant, I don't think he felt that in an arrogant sense. He felt it in a way that really is beyond me, and I think most people don't tend to have those kinds of um, uh, senses of mission, but he genuinely did. I think um, from the time I knew Elvis, I certainly thought that he was different from all the other guys that I had known and been around, and um, and he felt that too, I'm sure, because of a little um, insecurity, maybe, to be around other people, even, um, and um, coming from a small um, town and a relatively poor family into the big city when he came to Memphis. I think he was kind of um, uh, maybe ridiculed a little, being a poor country boy, that kind of thing. You know, teenagers can be very cruel. And um, I think he was um, a little insecure because of that. So he was um, a little more sensitive, I think, to things that people would say to him. Elvis, of course, was shy to people who did not know him. If you walked into a room and he was there, uh, you would think he was shy because you would probably look at him differently when you walked into the room. You would look at him and say, who is he? Because he didn't look like everybody else in the room. And uh, that in itself would have a tendency to make him back off because of other people's reaction to him. Okay, but then after you got to know him, if someone introduced you and told you who he was, he immediately would make you feel comfortable. He was not a good dancer with a partner. He was very good on the floor by himself, but he and I had a terrible time dancing together because um, he's not used to uh, leading somebody else because everything he did was so spontaneous. Um, I probably couldn't have kept up with him anyway, but uh, he, it, it was funny because so many people thought he was so rhythmic, he had to be a wonderful dancer. And I said, well, he is, as long as he's by himself. <laughs> Most of the stations, the radio stations, there was probably at that time only one station in Memphis that even played black um, artists. So it was unusual to, um, to hear a white kid, um, you know, get involved and enjoy that music so much and to imitate it. I probably heard more black music every day than he ever did white. Yeah. I mean, you know, on the radio, uh, there'd be probably one country station, definitely two or three black ones, and if you went out in the street and walked around, what you'd be hearing would be black music on the streets. And guys playing or just out of stores or speakers or coming out of apartment windows or shacks. Predominantly, music would be black. Mm. So much of his repertoire, right through to the end of his life, stems back to things that he heard in 53, 54, 55 from Roy Hamilton, from Ray Charles, from Laverne Baker. This, this obviously just totally grabbed his imagination. There was a small record shop not far from his house uh, that you could go in, play the music, play the records if you wanted to buy them and do that. And we didn't usually buy them, but we would go up there and play the records and just sit and listen to the records there. Elvis's background was very much more than country and it got, was gospel country and the, the southern blues and race music that we called it then, which later became rock and roll or rhythm and blues. He had a very diversified background of that music and he, he knew it all. Elvis had a, he had a, a real feel for latching on to something. Uh, that caught his ear. I mean, it not not everything caught his ear. He didn't miss many things, but if it caught his ear, 
uh, and, I, and another one is Jerry Lee Lewis. It, if that caught his ear, I mean, it, it's like a photographic memory. It had astounded Sam Phillips. It would later astound Lieber and Staller that Elvis knew all these R&B artists, not only the well-known ones, but the obscure ones as well. Sam finally was persuaded to give him a chance, had him come in. He sang virtually everything he knew, probably sang almost everything he knew within the course of a single song. Uh, but, um, and Sam obviously heard something in his voice. He heard a vulnerability, he heard a different, a differentness. Sam always has said, you know, if you're not doing something different, you're not doing nothing. And uh, with Elvis, Elvis was clearly doing something different. That's all playing with sounds and things that were out of the ordinary that made me become extremely, extremely interested in untried, unproven talent. Now with Elvis, uh, he was probably as nervous as anybody black or white I had ever seen in front of a microphone in a studio. Uh, and nobody worked any harder at being able, and he and I talked about this a lot. I said, Elvis, the only mistake that you can make that's permanent in, 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 in music is if you don't relax now, whether it takes you another session or two or whatever, audition or two, I'm not going to get impatient with you if I keep hearing something, but if you don't let yourself relax your throat and everything and I said if you'll make a mistake I don't give a damn make sure that you make a positive mistake don't hold back and screw up the whole damn thing because you're afraid you might stumble over a word I said make that a part of the song this is Sam's whole point in everything he's ever done in his life he'll tell you about perfect imperfection he knew when it was time to go for a take is all important in making records. You know, guys are sitting around in the studio playing and, uh, oh, let them, let them go through it again, uh, now. And I think Sam had that instinct for when the real take was gonna come. He didn't just keep going and keep going and then say, oh, we'll check them out later. And it, it was like, he was waiting for a moment in the studio, I think, uh, you know, where he could sense the atmosphere and, that the guys were ready to go, and like, okay, and he'd kind of know that it, the next one was going to be a take before anybody else did. The most special thing about Presley was that uh, <clears throat> he had a mental picture. Now keep in mind, 18, 19 year old kid, he had a mental picture of where he was going when he heard a few words of the song. Uh, there was a certain element, now not, I'm not just talking about tempo necessarily, but he had his own little kick, quote unquote, version of how this word ought to be said. Now that's the first thing that I pick up, that's what you call style. Elvis couldn't have worked with just anybody initially. It, it took my spotty Scotty as the guy I wanted to, to work with Elvis as soon, because Elvis did not have a band of his own, never had had a band of his own. Most, even amateurs, you know, have a little old band they play, pick together. Elvis never had that, but it worked out perfectly. I couldn't have picked better people for that particular uh, occasion than, than we did. Sam saw uh, Scotty and Bill, an electric guitarist, an electric guitar and a bass, as being all that was needed to augment the acoustic rhythm guitar that Elvis supplied. I was far more into the band, even than Elvis. He's, he's got a good voice, he's singing. I was just as interested in the band as I was Elvis. I just considered him to be part of it. You know, what really knocked me out, Bill Black, Scotty Mott, 
and DJ, because a lot of the early ones didn't have drums on them even. And this is the funny thing. Here's the king of rock and roll, and some of his earliest records don't actually have drums on them. What we did at Sun Records is the most fascinating thing of the minds and the soul and the spirit of people crossing and absolutely building a confidence with these people where they will do things that they didn't even know they could do themselves. And I, in turn, will do things with knobs and the idea of the intercourse during the session of talking and carrying on foolishness or whatever we needed to do. All of these things came together for what we did, and we flat changed the world of music. He didn't know what he's looking for, uh, but when he but he did know when he heard it. Sam was a taskmaster. I'll say that he would he'd push you. Uh, you know, give, give me one more. Okay, I think we got it that time, but let's just go one more time. And sometimes you get so damn mad you'd want to go in and grab you know, and throttle him, but. Uh, I would say that Bill Black contributed a lot because Bill was a barrel of monkeys. He was funny. Uh, he'd carry on craziness, and of course, Scotty was the opposite. And Elvis, between the two, I think he felt at home. Back then, every bass player that just about on anybody's show was a comedian. They did. They slapped the bass, fell down on the floor. You know, did. Told jokes, they told jokes. Him and Elvis had a couple of routines that they did just right off, just to do something. And But Bill was always funny. He, uh, he kept the ball rolling. And a lot of times when we first started, had it not been for Bill, we would just died on the vine. And nobody knew who Elvis was. And they said, what, what's that boy doing out there jumping all over that stage? Well, Bill would just slap his bass, stomp, and run around the stage. And somehow or another, you get all them people on Elvis' side, you know. I said, well, he's a good old boy, and Bill's doing a good job. And, but he, he saved us a lot of nights from just dying. Well, that's all right, Mama. That's all right for you. That's all right, Mama. Just Most of the requests that I would get would be for the first record. That's all right, Mama. We, I had to play. I played it. I guess nearly every hour. My show was three or four hours long, and you, you'd play that. That's all right, Mama. Took over. Blue Moon in Kentucky didn't get near the play later. That uh, that's all right, Mama did. In, in my particular area. When Elvis hit, the minute that that's all right came out, it wasn't as if this started a revolution. It galvanized a revolution, and you had you had these uh, um, country, poor country boys in every direction. You had Carl Perkins in Tennessee, you had Jerry Lee Lewis in Louisiana, you had Sleepy LaBeef in Houston, Texas. They heard this music. And it wasn't they said, oh, I never heard anything like it before. They said, this is what I've been aiming for. This is the thing that I've been groping for. And they immediately snapped to it. Not because Elvis expressed something new, but he, but he expressed something they had all been trying to express and something they had been hearing. They get off to a real good start with that, all right, Mama. The next two records uh, were nowhere as successful. Sales dropped on that. And uh, I think Elvis wanted so much to succeed that he couldn't afford to ignore what he learned about those two extra recordings. So when we get to Baby Let's Playhouse, it's like, you know, it's now. From the hiccups that the whole thing start with, it's like the most unusual and daring start of a record to changing the lyrics and getting the pink Cadillac in the story there, making it his song, is definitely one element. The next thing was, of course, that if anything was wild on Elvis' stage shows, after he put that record out, it was exactly that song, Baby Let's Play Out. People reacted to it when they saw him live uh, doing it because it went 
He was really, really alive when he performed, and that song was perfect for it. It also has uh, a great drive. It's really moving along like Sam thought it should. And, and, and it, although that song is in, in, in its lyric, uh, daring for the time, and it could be interpreted in a number of silly ways that it was never meant to because of, you know, lyrics like, I'd rather see your dead little girl than to be with another man, and all that stuff. Uh, it is a commercial record in a sense that what followed it, Mystery Train, as the next R&B cut that came out, that didn't necessarily have the same appeal. That was almost like a more fine-tuned version of the same drive element. That's almost all about drive. Babelis Playhouse, I, I just think that's one of, one of his better, it's a fun record. It was a natural for Elvis, just as natural as, I mean, as breathing. I mean, Babelis Playhouse, by this time we had worked up to where Elvis could read tempos, uh, he could read tempos as to whether Scott and Bill were pleased with it or whether I was pleased, you know, because we worked as a unit. No big shots around that place, you know. And, and oh, baby, let's play a house. I mean, that, that thing was just like, almost like Mystery Train. It was just a natural flow of beat and entertainment. I mean, it had a quotient of entertainment the way you just turned loose and let everything you had go right into every word on it. And you wouldn't use the words that was used originally. You made them up as you went. <laughs> Not in toto, but and, and to a great extent. I mean, it was just one of those things that it, the melody line on that thing is so good for a romping, stomping, let's get with it song that uh, it would be hard even for me to miss on Baby Let's Play House. <laughs> Mr. Train is one of the records that he had heard that I had put out by little Junior Parker. Uh, and uh, Junior wrote it, and he and I worked together on it. When it came up with it, uh, he's got a great version of it. And Elvis told me later on that uh, hearing Mr. Train by little Junior Parker and knowing it was on a record label that was in Memphis, you know? So uh, Mr. Train, to me, still is... Oh, it's not a profound thing in that it's got a, a lyric that would just grab you all of a sudden, but the rhythm we have on that thing and what it's about, and if you stop to think about it, you have felt that lonesome feeling. And the cut that you hear that was released is one that Elvis thought he was just running down, you know, and you hear him laugh on the very end of that thing. That is the cut, man. That was, that was the first cut. And I'm sure, as I say, we did a couple, three more. You just throw that stuff away. I mean, I mean, you talk about the, the perfect, imperfect cut. Well, that was it. Those sun tracks are like, that's Elvis Presley. What else he does after that is up to him. Uh, but, that's the essence right there. Money, honey, mystery train, baby, let's play health. You know, you say, I'm left, you're right, she's gone. That one still fucks me. There's some wrong. <laughs> but we, I'll have to talk to Scotty about that. And um, yeah, the sound and the attitude on those were, were just so pure, so unforced, so in a way joyous, you know. I mean, one used to be able to say gay, but we don't know. <laughs> I mean, why do they keep stealing words? But um, there was yeah, an enthusiasm that, that came right off the tape, bounced right off the heads, uh, you know, from Elvis and the band, you know. I mean, you can hear him laughing in some of the chat. You know, this is like... He just, um, for the most part, acted like a normal teenager. Yeah, he was about 18 at the time. And uh, me and Bill were old men in comparison. <laughs> I've been traveling over miles, even through the valleys too. 
I've been traveling. In the word fan is absolutely named right because it's a derivative of fanatics, and they are fanatics. But I've seen it, it's just you cannot believe that, uh, what they'll do. Yep, it's something. Uh, they crawl in windows and climb fire escapes and on the hotels. And he handled it good. It was, it was fun. The whole thing was fun to him. I mean, when he was on stage, and which, uh, that was his, that was his territory. But he was having fun with the people. Yeah, he was always talking to girls. He didn't go steady with them. We're not when we were on the road. We didn't, well, we didn't have time. People, you know, they always said, you know, we did so many wild things, but I wish we'd have done all the things they said we'd have done. It'd have been okay, but we didn't have time. We was right back in that car the minute that show was over. Boom, another 500 miles, you know. So we really didn't have time to even take a look at a girl, hardly. See him on stage and we'd be gone. And I'll never forget this uh, a place called the Rio Palm Isle down in Texas. I forget Lubbock or one of the little towns. We were in there and a fight broke out right in the middle of the show. And Scotty Moore was trying to protect his guitar. He was going to pick it up, and somebody stepped right in the middle of it, swinging. And we got out in the parking lot, and it was an acre parking lot of people fighting. I mean, fists flying everywhere. And uh, we were trying to get in the car, and these little girls were wading through the crowd. We want your autograph, your autograph. And, you know, fists were flying all over the place. But luckily, you know, he got in the car and he signed an autograph and we took off. But the show ended abruptly there. So that's, that's the things that happened in the early days. I asked him what he wanted uh, out of his career and he said he really wanted to be a movie actor, uh, the next James Dean. And I could see it. Uh, he had that rebel without a cause look to him, but sort of a cleaned up version. Uh, he, he did look uh, a little bit young, too young to be a real James Dean type, but that's what he had in mind. Uh, we talked about James Dean's death, and he told me that he thought James Dean saved his life because when he was killed, uh, he realized that he himself, Elvis, uh, was driving his cars too fast, and uh, he didn't want to end up the way Dean did, so he said, I decided to take it easy and uh, not take so many chances in my car for whatever that was worth. I was the one who told her to kiss the way that she kisses you now. And you know the way she touches your cheek. Well, I told her how. He'd been used to working with Sam Phillips, who had a vision, an idea, like he had himself. But when he turned up at RCA Studio in Nashville, uh, recording under Steve Scholes and Chet Atkins, if he was looking for guidance, he didn't get it. I mean, he was basically told to do what he did. Um, and I don't, I mean, none of these two people were musically ignorant. But I'm not sure they knew what to suggest to Elvis to do other than stay faithful to the fact that the man had actually developed himself out on the road and proved himself and that might be better to stick with that than try and go and tamper with it. Steve Scholes was a uh, very uh, nice gentleman, I thought. Later years I found out he tried to get us fired, but it uh, uh, didn't matter to me now. Uh, very easy to work with. He let us. He had talked to Sam, I found out, and Sam had advised him to uh, just more or less let us have our, not our way, but uh, uh, don't try to restrict too much what you want uh, done. And it worked fine. Live, he would grab all these elements of music he loved, as long as they were fast songs, because slow songs would go, you know, would be bummers. And when he started recording for RCA, that was what he knew how to do, draw on that material from way back. This is why we got I Got a Woman and Money Honey on the first session. This is why we get Tutti Frutti, I'm going to sit right down, cry over you, Lord Miss Claudia, and shake right and roll on, on the second RCA session.
he went by the feel of it. He was not about whether everybody just played everything exactly right. If the song had the right feel, and he would go on forever till the feel was there, if that was the problem, but he'd stop after take three if he knew he had it. And basically what we see at this stage is an average of six to ten takes is what it takes to get these songs recorded. And uh, that is fairly quickly, although you might argue some of them have been well rehearsed on the road. The thing is that Elvis and the boys, the band, had a sound which they'd worked on, honed down and perfected. And all you've got to do is put them in the room, put a couple of mics up, and you'll get the sound that they intended to make. If you put guys in a room and then shove 15 mics and then mix it and re-tear it all to bits, I mean, as my dad said, there's a difference between scratching your ass and tearing it to bits. <laughs> you know? I know, believe me, I've been there. I'm just as much, I mean, the more tracks available, you'd use them for some reason. You know, when you actually know that the records you really love have probably done two track, three track, four track. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's like there's an over, you know, over techno, in a way, for, what, for that kind of music. You, know. you couldn't make music like that today unless you just stuck two good mics up in a good room. Well, if your bad believes you, then you've got to tell the tale. Just take a walk down on the street to a heartbreak hotel where you'll be. You'll be so lonely, baby. We'll be so lonely. As you can hear, they're not quite there yet. There's uncertainties in some parts, although they've actually been playing this song for a while live. Um, and again, this is Elvis's own determination. He found this song himself, or it was given to him by, actually by uh, Mayborn Axton, uh, Colonel Parker's former publicist. But Elvis picked it and decided that he wanted, promised that he would want to record it. And uh, as early as December 55, three weeks before he records it, he tells a small audience at a little club in, in Arkansas that that's going to be his first hit record. Heartbreak Hotel was, uh, uh, again, a prime example of musical fusion. It was definitely a, a slow rocker full of a lot of the recording artifact, uh, reverb, um, uh, bass enhancement, um, which in a way focused the sound and made it um, simpler, uh, more, more direct. And of course, it, that enhanced the lyric tremendously. Um, what people made of Heartbreak Hotel was that it was just a, a wonder record. It was something, it was, the, the, there was something very melodramatic about the lyric, first of all, about this terrible place, Heartbreak Hotel. And when Elvis delivered it absolutely as though he was recording from there, um, people reacted. They reacted viscerally. They, they enjoyed it. Uh, they, they were shocked by it. They were amazed at this, this voice that was telling this dreadful story. Well, if your baby leaves you, you got a tale to tell. Or just take a walk down the lonely street to Heartbreak Hotel where you will be. Steve Scholes, the producer, was trying to get that echo that Sam got. Phillips down in Memphis, but uh, he never did succeed. Uh, but we were, they had a long hallway and they needed an echo chamber. So that was the echo chamber. They run a couple mics down there. And everybody had to be quiet not to walk down the hallway because it'd be, you know, it'd feed into, you know, into the mics down there. So uh, when when they got ready to cut, they just locked the doors, the outside doors, so nobody could get in. And that's how that's how that one was cut. And of course, uh, it was just, you know, his first big RCA release of uh, overnight nationwide, world, almost worldwide distribution, and it just saturated the country. They couldn't keep it in stock, and the pressing plants just went 24 hours a day. I think that it's, it's interesting to to know that although Sam had had a few drummers playing on a few tracks at Sun, 
DJ Fontana had never played on Elvis' Sun recordings. It was his first shot when they got to Nashville uh, to play. So he was always suggesting things to play. Sometimes he'd get on, on me, sometimes he'd say, can you play that? I said, I can't play that, Elvis. You're too complicated for me. He, he had some licks in his mind that nobody could play, you know. Just, he didn't think of them as, as he, in tempo or anything. He just come up with something. I said, no, it won't work. We can't play that. It'll just be all out of whack. Okay, well, play what you want to play, you know. But he had an idea of what he wanted. The point is that, that uh, you hear Elvis doing a song like Blue Suede Shoes in one of the New York sessions. And he takes it just at a gallop. Uh, and it's a wonderful, this tremendous energy, this tremendous enthusiasm. The energy, the enthusiasm, Elvis is just, it's like he's out of the barn. That carries the day. But you know that had they worked on it in the Sun studio, had they done another four or five or 10 or 12 takes, um, that it would have become something quite different. Sam Phillips' idea about rhythm, everything revolved around rhythm for Sam, but the idea to some extent was that if you retired the rhythm, that then as you push against the retired, you get a greater sense of urgency, a greater sense of just go. And, and that simply, you know, and the Blue Suede Shoes is recorded for RCA, it's just go, go, go all the way. Well, Elvis would be the first one if he were here to say that um, he just did not get what was in that song out. And uh, so I never did like Elvis's version because I knew what he could have done by slowing it a little bit and doing a little bit more of Elvis and staying away from Carl a little more and could have made it, uh, well, if I had to cut it with Elvis, uh, you would have known it's the same song, but uh, it would have had an entirely different feel. The other thing, I guess, to me, that's important about Elvis, right from the beginning, is he didn't write songs. And that puts him in a different bag to say Buddy Holly or Eddie Cochran or Chuck Berry. So I think it's, it is important to remember that Elvis is not a writer. He was a great interpreter. G2WB1294, take three. Take five. G2 WB1294, take nine. I was the one was a song actually um, delivered by Steve Scholes to Elvis. And just a few months later at a radio interview, uh, Elvis claims it's one of his favorite recordings. It was one of the ones he was most proud of. Basically, it is a feel. I think all music should be a feel music, but some is more than others. Uh, and to me, what's always been amazing is that something as nebulous as what we call feel or a groove or uh, can actually be transmitted onto a bit of plastic and still retain forever the atmosphere and you know that that is pretty far out for, you know to, you know a feel is something that happens in the room while you're doing it and you think that it's gone once you've done it but what with recording, I think the amazing thing is that actually that feeling is impressed upon the, you know, the software, whatever you want to call it, you know, now. <laughs> Forever, and that's the amazing thing. And I think Elvis knew that instinctively. Album number one. In more ways than one. 